It's so much fun once in a while to not be part of the worship team and just to be out there and just to experience it. Because didn't they do a phenomenal job this morning? Yeah. Amen. And it's not about a performance. It's not about entertainment. It's about leading us into the presence of God. And honestly, sometimes you don't really think about it, but there are challenges to leading people into the presence of God. Like, for instance... You may not have thought about it, but I did because weird things pop into my head all the time. Just ask our pastor. He knows that's to be true. Like, for instance, if you are a public speaker, you have to constantly be aware of whether or not your mic is on or off. Because you might be in a conversation with someone that doesn't need to be a public conversation, but if you have your mic on, the whole congregation may know what you're talking about. And for instance, this morning, when they were up here leading us in that song, Kelly and Joy were like, and then they go to the left, and we'll go. They're moving to the right. They're moving to your left. You didn't think about that, but they had to. Because there are challenges that come in leading into people into worship. And it was just kind of fun this morning to sit there and just enjoy the fact that God has blessed us with a tremendous team to lead us into his presence. And honestly, it is so easy to come into a pulpit and preach when the table is set before you like that, people drawn into the presence of God. And I believe that you're ready to receive from the Lord this morning, aren't you? Well, I want to share with you this morning, the title of my message, I, th I always try to come up with something kind of catchy or something a little, little away from the obvious from my title, and I just couldn't do it this week. The title of my message comes straight from my text. It's titled, Taking Every Thought Captive. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. God, we thank you that as we're able to dig deep within there, God, we know that it's just not a book, it's just not ink on a page, and it's just not words that we read, but God, it is life and it is truth, and you'll speak to us. It'll come alive in our hearts if we'll let it, God, and we can leave this place transformed by the power of your word at work in our life. The Holy Spirit taking what we hear and what we read and what we see and just making application that, God, when we leave this place, we don't have to be the same as we came in. God, we can be transformed by your word at work in our lives. Holy Spirit, just move in us today. God, I pray that you will speak to us in a way that, Lord, we'll take what we hear and, God, apply it to our lives. And as we leave this place, Lord, we'll be just a little bit more like you. And Father, the next time that we get into our Bibles, whether it be in our devotional time or whether we're listening to a, a preacher on the radio or on the TV or, or next Sunday when we come hear the word here again, that God will be transformed just a little bit more into your likeness, a little bit more into your image, that Father, eventually, God, as we decrease, you'll increase. And Father, our footprint will become smaller and your footprint in our lives will become greater. That Father, we will truly be disciples of the Most High God. That when they see us, they won't see us, but they'll see you in us. Father, help us to be transformed today, I pray. Help us to be made in your image, Father. Father, help us to set aside those things that would trip us up and cause us to be hindered. But Father, help us to look to you, the author and finisher of our faith to change us into who you want us to be. Lord, thank you for loving us enough to take us the way we were, but loving us too much to leave us in that state. God, you constantly want to draw us close to you. Father, I thank you for the promise of your word that if we draw nigh unto you, that you will draw nigh unto us. It's not an empty pursuit to go after you, God. You long to be with us. You long for us to be in your presence. Lord, let your word go forth powerfully this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I always love it when I don't tell people what I'm going to preach on. And the worship team just nails it. That last song, I love that song to begin with, Overcome. And we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the shed blood of Jesus Christ poured over our lives, and by the word of our testimony. And we'll get into where that applies and what I'm going to share in just a few minutes. But I love it when the, when the praise team nails it. Good job, guys. Awesome. Thank you, Lord, for guiding them into that. Gerald McGinnis is the pastor of a 2,000-member church of God in Knox, what, Knoxville, Tennessee, the, the Park West Church of God. He's well-known within the Church of God, uh, a well-known pastor. He served as chaplain to the FBI, the ATF, uh, the Sheriff's Department down in Knox County. He's very involved in this community. But 48 years ago, 
On March 22, 1968, at about 3 o'clock in the morning, Army Specialist McGinnis found himself in the jungles of Vietnam in a bunker being attacked by an estimated 1,500 North Vietnamese. And he knew that if the perimeter was taken of the compound, all could be lost. All of those Americans that, are, that were fighting that war over there were in danger. The bunkers near him were destroyed, but over the next three or four hours, he didn't retreat, he, he stayed in his post. He had three of his fellow comrades that were wounded, could no longer fight for themselves. He stayed in his post and protected them and protected the perimeter from the oncoming enemy. He used every Claymore mine he detonated that he could. They say he estimatedly used about 1,000 rounds through his M16 and threw probably about 30 hand grenades to keep the enemy at bay. And when the battle was over the next morning, within just yards of his position, there was an enormous body count of his enemy. Now he was just recently honored for this act at camp meeting in Tennessee uh, for being the hero that he was. But what he understood that night, 48 years ago, in the jungle of Vietnam, was that he was in a battle. He was in a tremendous battle that he understood he could not lose that battle. It was that vital. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're going to read verses 3 through 5. It's a very familiar passage of Scripture. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, had Specialist McGinnis retreated, his three army buddies would have been killed because they couldn't defend themselves anymore. They were injured, they were wounded beyond the ability to fight. The major part of the perimeter would have been breached and the compound could have fallen had he not held that bunker. That battleground was vital to the protection and survival of those American troops. And the truth of it is today is we are in a battle. Every day of our Christian lives, we are in a battle and sometimes we don't realize how vital that battle is. What we give up if we don't hold our ground, if we don't hold our position and we surrender that position to the enemy, it's not just the position that's lost. We have to fall back into a defensive place rather than from a place where we have the tactical advantage against the enemy. But why is it, does it seem that we're willing to give up that battle? Now my message this morning today is a simple message, but it's a hard message. And as I wrote that down as I was preparing, I thought to myself, how can something be simple and hard? They seem to almost be a little bit exclusive of one another. If it's simple, how can it be hard? If it's hard, how can it be simple? And I got, went to the game of baseball and thought about that. Think with me for a minute about the game of baseball. If you didn't know about the game of baseball, and I were to just say, okay, we're going to put you on a field. There's going to be a, lo a straight line that runs this way. And at a right angle, there's going to be a straight line that runs that way. And they're both going to go for probably at least about 300 feet. And for those of you that are football fans, that's about the length of a football field from the goal line to the goal line. For those of you that aren't football fans, if you're from the West Coast, it's about halfway up the Space Needle in Seattle. If you've ever been to Washington, D.C., it's about halfway up the Washington Monument. We're going to have a line that runs that way that far and that way that far. And then there's going to be a fence that kind of circles around the outside part of it, kind of like a fan. And what I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to give you a stick. And there's going to be a guy standing on a pile of dirt, and he's going to throw a ball to you. And I want you to hit that ball and then take off running as fast as you can this way. 90 feet, 
and at least get to that base. That sounds simple enough, but I'm going to make it even easier. I'm only going to ask you to be successful 32 or 60 or 32 percent of the time. I'm going to let you fail 68 percent of the time. So if out of every hundred times you come up and try to hit that ball, if you mess up 68 of them, that's just fine. You can be a failure. You can go back to the dugout. They'll pat you on the back, say, oh, I'll get them next time. So that's simple. But can I tell you, it's incredibly hard. Did you know that in the history of baseball, only 50 men have accomplished that over the course of their careers spanning however many years? Only 50 men have been successful hitting the ball in between those two lines and at least getting to first base before they were out. 32 times out of 100. If you do that, and do it over the course of, say, 15 years, every man that has done that has averaged 32 out of 100 attempts to get on base. Every one of those has been inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. So it sounds simple. The concept is simple, but the task is hard. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. It's a very simple concept, but it's a hard task. Every second of every day, we're engaged in a battle for control of our minds, whether we know it or not. And here's what I want to come away from this morning's message with an understanding of how very important that battle is. You know, it's easy to say, if you're a baseball player and you're down six runs in the bottom of the ninth inning, just say, you know what? We'll get them tomorrow. There's 162 games a year. We'll get them tomorrow. No big deal. We can let this one slide. Nobody wins every game. But if that's the mentality we take to our walk with Christ, we are going to be so very defeated. Because the battle that we face every day, we need to come out victorious. We need to have the mentality, win or go home. One of my favorite times of year is March. I love college basketball, March Madness, this wonderful, crazy tournament. 68 teams get in. Four of them have to play, basically, you know, actually, I think it's four or eight of the teams have to play to actually even get into the 64 team field. And then you've got to win six games in a row because if you lose, there's no tomorrow. You come home and watch it on a couch like I do. And so it is absolutely serious stuff for them. There is no turning back. And that's the approach that we have to, to, to take as we battle this battle for our mind. It's win or go home. We cannot lay down. We cannot give up. We cannot surrender position because the enemy will take more and more and more and more. If you give him this much, he'll take that and a little more. And then the, the next day, he'll take a little more. And before you know it, you'll walk so defeated, you'll think, is there anything to this Christianity? God, why can't I be successful in this thing? Well, we're giving up ground and giving up ground and giving up ground. I'm telling you this morning, we have to stop giving up ground. We have to be prepared for the battle, understand that it's a battle that we face. It's not a game. It's not just something that we do in our spare time. From the day that we committed our life to Jesus Christ, the devil put a target on our back and said, I'm taking you down. I'm going to make you think that there's nothing to this, that God's not real. God is dead. He doesn't matter. He can't help you. But I want to tell you this morning that is a lie of the devil. And the truth, which is not in him, is that we can overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. We must win the battle for our mind. Galatians 5 and 1 puts it this way. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be under a yoke of bondage. But we find ourselves in bondage to different things. I'm very thankful because I don't really know what it's like to, de to deal with a chemical bondage. I've never been an alcoholic. I've never been... a 
a smoker. I've never uh, done drugs. I've never done that. God kept me from a lot of things, and I'm very thankful for that. But I'm even more thankful that God can set people free that deal with those things. But not so we can get ourselves back into that stuff. God has set us free. Whom the Son has made free is free indeed. That's what the Word of God tells us. We don't have to be in bondage to those things. Now tomorrow we will celebrate the 240th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Where we as a nation proclaimed that we are free. And blood was shed and lives were lost so we could have that freedom. And over the last 240 years, many lives have been lost. Much blood has been shed to keep this a place where we have freedom. And as a believer, we have freedom in Christ because precious blood was shed. That we could stand here and say, I am free because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Do you know that the bondage that people walk in is, is usually not forced upon them? We walk into bondage. We allow ourselves to get into bondage, into things. You know, we open little doors. Open a little crack for the devil to just kind of make his way in. I'll tell you what, he's not that smart, he's just old. And he's been at it a long time, so he knows the tricks that work. And if we'll open the door, he'll take that opening. And he'll step in and he'll bring you into bondage as quick as you can turn around and not even realize you're there. Pastor said it many different times. We've said it from this pulpit. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Because we'll open a little door. We'll give a little place under the excuse of trying something. Or, or is that, did God really mean to be that strict? Now, I don't want to bring you under legal, uh, uh, the bondage of legalism either. But I don't want us to open a door to the things that the enemy will use to destroy our lives. The bondage that we walk into doesn't just happen. It starts in our mind. When we make an excuse or we just make a decision to do something, you know, I'll, I'll just try it this one time. And the next thing you know, well, that was fun. I'll try it one more time. Well, that's not really hurting me. I, I was fine. I didn't, didn't lose anything. I'm not under any bondage. Before you know it, you are so bound up. And it doesn't start with an action. It starts with a thought. And that's why Paul tells us to take every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That's the battle. The battle takes place in your mind. Before I ever walk into sin, I think about doing it. I don't accidentally wake up and say, oh my gosh, I'm in the middle of sin. There was a song several years ago by a fellow named Gary Chapman, and one of the lines in it is said, he said, I'm so tired of planning my next fall. Because he realized something that I think we all need to realize is when we struggle with sin, whatever that sin might be, it doesn't matter. God will use, or not God, the devil will use whatever will work with you. Devil doesn't tempt me with alcohol because I care less about it. There's never going to be a day that I, I, I foresee that that is going to be something that appeals to me. Tasted it as a teenager, hated it, don't want anything to do with it. But he knows how to, how to get under my skin. He knows how to make me react in a way that's not appropriate when my kids drive me nuts. Every parent says amen. Amen. We think it's just our kid driving us nuts, but the devil sees a door of opportunity. I don't care what the sin is. Vicki, in the time that you have been free from your drug addiction, has the devil tried to tempt you to get back into that? I bet it's at time, especially at the beginning, it was really difficult at times to say no. How long has it been? Nine and a half years this woman has walked in the power of God, free from that addiction. You know about the power of taking every thought captive, don't you? Not letting those things just stick around in her mind and work on her and eat at her until in a weak moment she gives into it. 
She knows the destruction that addiction can bring in her life. And she doesn't want to walk in that anymore. She wants, in, wants to walk in the liberty for which Christ has set us free. Say that with me. Take every thought captive. Say it again. Take every thought captive. If you leave with nothing else today, I want you to understand that we are in a battle and we must take every thought captive. I want to share with you three things about taking every thought captive this morning. The first one's pretty simple. It says, don't be surprised when things in captivity act wild. On May 28th of this year, you may remember in the Cincinnati Zoo, there was a terrible incident that took place. A little three-year-old boy got away from his parents, got through a hedge of trees, over a railing, and dropped 10 to 12 feet into to the water in the gorilla uh, area of the, the zoo. Do you remember that? That was horrible. Everybody was, there were people that were upset with the parents. I've got a two and a half year old son. I know how quick they can get away. You barely blink and they can be gone. So I don't really blame the parents. But it was tragic because that child got into the, uh, into the gorilla area and a 17-year-old gorilla, I wrote down his name, what was his name? Harambi, yeah, that's right, Harambi. 17-year-old gorilla, they thought possibly might be trying to save the child that first went over and got that child and drug it out of the water. But they said that it was violently dragging this child. And so they had to make a decision and they chose to put that gorilla down. It was unfortunate, it was horrible because that gorilla did nothing but be a gorilla. He was just living in his gorilla space, doing his gorilla thing, and all of a sudden he's like, hey kid, I'll go get him. Hi, my name's Harambe. Come with me. And the parent was up there probably thinking, if you ever do that again, maybe that's all he was doing was trying to correct the child. But the truth of it is, is that gorilla was a wild animal. And it was unpredictable. And the officials, in 38 years that that gorilla exhibit had existed at the Cincinnati Zoo, they had never had someone get into it like that. And they never knew how that gorilla was going to respond. And so they felt they had no choice but to shoot that gorilla. And I think that's sad. But I think it's wonderful that that three-year-old's life was saved. Because how horrible would it have been had that gorilla killed that child? And so yes, they made the right decision. It was a hard decision that had to be made. But the gorilla was only doing what a gorilla does. Act like a gorilla. And the truth of it is, when we take thoughts captive, don't be surprised that that captive thought is going to try to run wild in your mind. It's not just grabbing that thought and say, okay, I'll put this right here in my pocket. I'll never have to deal with you again. How many of you know that's not how it works? Don't be surprised when those thoughts that you take captive act wild. You may have to take it captive every day of your life. You may have to take it captive multiple times every day. But don't be surprised when something wild acts wild. Just have a two-year-old if you want to see, it in, in, uh, see evidence of it. Because my little boy, he's getting more and more wild. I wouldn't trade him for a thing, but I expect it now. And I know sometimes I've got to take him captive. He don't like that. He squirms. He scre he's got a shrill scream. Oh my goodness, bust my eardrum. But sometimes when he wants what he wants, I've got to take him captive because I'm trying to, to keep him safe. And we've got to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, even when they run wild. Romans chapter, and I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 10, verses 6 through 13. Let's read that this, this morning. I want to give you something that you can use when those thoughts try to run wild. This is the passage of Scripture that talks about the armor of God. Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the, in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. You can't will yourself. into victory. You can't just close your eyes and say, I'm not here. It's, it's not happening to me. We have to be prepared for the battle and we have to have the right tools. The tools are given to us in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. I remember as a little kid having the armor of God play set. It was awesome. It was much smaller as I get older than I remember it to be. But it was, it was plastic it was great. You fight the devil. Had a little hel plastic helmet of salvation. You had a, the breastplate of righteousness that kind of used to strap around you until you got grew it, but you still wanted to wear it. The belt of truth and the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel peace. Fancy way of saying shoes. And you had the, the, the shield of faith. Yeah, faith. A faith on you. And the sword of the Spirit. Oh yeah, boy, I was, I was dressed. I was decked out. I had the armor of God and I would face every imaginary devil that would come my way. And I won every time. I was awesome. <laughs> it was great. I used to kick devil tail. Oh, if you had no... He didn't even come around my house. All I had to do was set this helmet of salvation on the porch. He's like, I ain't going there. I won every time. Did you know that we need to win every time when we fight that battle for our mind? And God has given us the tools that we need because we don't fight the physical thing. I don't have to get into an arm wrestling battle with the devil to decide whether or not I get to take that thought captive in my mind. It's a spiritual fight that we wage, but we try to fight that fight in our flesh at times. And when you fight with your flesh, we lose. Paul uses the imagery of the armor of God. It's handy sometimes to use imagery to help us think about the, the tools, tools and weapons that we have. Because it's not actually a breastplate that I'm wearing. It's the righteousness of God that he has applied to my life. It's not an actual shield, no matter how much as a young child I thought it was. And I was going to take that shield and just pop the devil in the nose with it. It's my faith, faith to believe that God is who He says He is. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. I have all those things. And, and imagery is sometimes helpful for us to get in our minds and help us remember who we are in God. For instance, last Wednesday night, Pastor Josh was not feeling well, so I uh, took care of youth for him. And I just shared with them something very simple that I use. It's imagery, actually, that I use when I pray. Because I asked him the question, I said, how many of you would rather spend an hour reading your Bible and how many would you rather spend an hour praying? And honestly, there's really no wrong answer to that. If you're going to spend an hour reading your Bible or an hour, Josh, if I can get your teens to either read the Bible for an hour or pray for an hour, are you good with either one of them? You're good, right? That's good. For me, it was always easier for me to read my Bible than it was to pray because I get distracted. I get distracted by goofy things about, hey, Joy's actually moving right when she says move to the left. And Kelly's actually moving left when she says move to the right. I get distracted by junk. And so I shared with them the imagery. I said, I have a garden. I have a little greenhouse that I have plants growing in there. And when I pray, every one of my plants is somebody in our church or somebody that I'm praying for or my family. Did you know that Pastor Michael is a cabbage? <laughs> he is. He's a cabbage. He's the cab. I have one cabbage plant. It's him. That's who I pray for. I have five tomato plants. My wife and kids are one tomato plant. My mom's another one. All three of my siblings and their families are tomato plants. Do you know, I, I told the teens, I said, we actually had three teenagers that were there that are part of the group that I pray for, for my green beans. So I started calling him Green Bean. Hey, Green Bean, what's up? But the imagery of my garden helps focus me when I pray 
and keep me from getting distracted. It's a simple thing. It's a goofy thing, but it works for me. And Paul is using imagery here to help us understand the weapons that are at our disposal when we fight against those wild things that we're trying to hold captive. So I'm not surprised that my thoughts want to run wild. I'm empowered by the imagery that Paul uses to help me know that the armor of God will help me overcome those wild thoughts that I'm trying to keep captive. The second thing I want us to think about this morning is that just because it's raised in captivity doesn't necessarily change the nature of that beast. Specifically, I want to speak to those of you who have been raised in church all your life. It can be very dangerous for you because you get used to churchy things. You get used to how things are supposed to be. You get used to some of the scriptures that you've heard over and over and over again. Kevin and I were talking before service. I was just saying how glad I was to see him on his guitar again. He was, he was just saying about how much the tips of his fingers hurt. If any of you have ever started playing guitar, you understand his pain. Because until you develop those calluses on the end of your finger that allow... I mean, it's like a wire digging into your finger. That hurts. And if you don't play very often, it hurts until those calluses get built up. And the truth of it is, if you've been raised in church and around it your whole life, you can get so calloused to the things of God that it just seems so commonplace that you don't realize that even though... It may have been raised in captivity. The nature of that wild thing is to be wild. You ever heard the story of the scorpion and the frog? There was a scorpion trying to get across a body of water, and it can't swim. So it goes to this frog and says, Hey, frog, I need to get across this body of water. Can I ride on your back and you swim across there? Because you're an amphibian. You can get across... And the frog's kind of like, um, you're a scorpion, right? No. You will sting me and I will die. And I don't want to die. And the scorpion's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, no, come on. If you're giving me a ride, why would I sting you? Because you'll drown and then I'll drown. I can't swim. And the frog thinks, well, you know, that actually makes sense. All right, hop on. And so they're going across. He's doing his little frog thing. I won't do the leg part of it because that'd look silly. He's doing his frog thing. And all of a sudden, that scorpion, bam, strikes that frog. And as that frog is about to die, he looks at the scorpion and says, Why? Why would you do this? You know it's dooming both of us to our fate. And the scorpion looked at the frog and said, It is my nature. It is the very nature of those thoughts to be wild. Do not get calloused to the things that God has that can protect you from the very nature of those things that will drag you away from Him. That will drag you away from the relationship with God that you want to have. It was in October of 2003 at the Mirage in, in Las Vegas, Nevada. I wasn't there. Um, Siegfried and Roy, you know who, remember who they were? They're the ones that had the white tigers and lions and all kind of stuff like that. They were doing a performance, and one of the tigers grabbed Roy, not Roy, Siegfried and Roy, Roy, by the neck and actually almost killed him. He ended up paralyzed. Even though they had had those tigers from... Are tiger, tigers cubs? Is that what the little tiger... tiger uh, from the time they were little cubs and had grown up, it still turned and attacked him even though it had been raised in captivity. So when we think we've got a handle on these things, we think that we've got these thoughts captive, we think we've got them, and we get callous to the danger of those thoughts that we're entertaining. Before you know it, just like the scorpion or just like that tiger, they can turn and strike us to our absolute detriment if we're not careful. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? 
It blows my mind that people that when they commit their heart to the Lord think they can just go on sinning and living the way that they want to. I don't understand that. Try that in your marriage. Honey, if you don't mind, I've got a date tonight. Yeah, you got a date with the back of my hand. But we treat God that way. We think that once we make our commitment to Him, we can still do the things that we want to do. If that is your understanding of, of the, the nature of the relationship of being a child of God, you need to read your Bible. You need to understand that that is not God's plan. He loves you the way that you were, but He wants to make you into the, His image. And His image is not unfaithful. Anyway, that's, just, that's for free. I didn't have that in my notes. Let's start again. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we, should, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. That phrase, done away with, is kind of an interesting word in the Greek. It's a word, it's katargethe is how it is in the Greek. Now it doesn't matter to you because you will not remember that probably past this morning. But what's interesting about it, that's a word that's used, or a form of it is used 27 times in the New Testament. This particular uh, spelling of it is used only once, right here in Romans chapter 6. And it says, done away with. But how many of you know that as believers, the body of sin, the, the old nature that we had, if we give it a chance, it'll rear its ugly head again. I would love it. I would absolutely love it if when you came to the altar and you prayed, God, forgive me of my sins, make me new, cleanse me, purify me. I know that I'm a sinner, I'm lost, and I need you. That God would just take that old nature and we'd never have to deal with it again. I would love that. That sounds like a deal. I'll take that one. But the word that's used here, it can be translated as done away with or abolished. But really, it, it, it's, it's a word that kind of means to make it of no effect. Sort of to render it inoperative. It's not that it's no longer there, but it has no authority, it has no power and no ability of, in and of itself. It would be great if it was absolutely gone. If it could be extricated from my life and I never had to deal with those challenges that I dealt with before I knew Christ. But I'm here to tell you this morning, that is not always the case. At times, I still have to fight that body of sin. I still have to fight that flesh. But when I fight the flesh with the flesh, I lose. Because although it may be rendered inoperative, although it might be made idle and, 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 and not have a power and ability, if I love on that thing, if I nurture that thing, it might have been in the ICU, but I can get it out of the hospital in just a short time. And I'll be fighting battles that I thought I was done with. And I understand why the Apostle Paul uses it the way that, that he does. The imagery he's using is that when we died with Christ, we're dead to those things. And the truth of it is, when the blood of Christ is shed across us, it no longer has power over us. Unless we give it to it. Unless we stop taking those thoughts captive, unless we begin to entertain those things that start as thoughts and become actions, we can negate what God gave us, this beautiful gift of not having to be bound by those things. But we can stir those things up again. The very nature of the body of sin is to sin, and I'm capable of waking that thing up, but I don't have to because God has placed within me as a believer everything that I need to walk victoriously over those sins in my life. I don't have to be bound by those things because the weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God. They are full effect. 
There's no stronghold. There's no imagination. There's no argument. There's no high thing that cannot be brought down by the power of God at work in my life. Because as a believer, that is the promise that God has given to me. The third thing this morning that I want us to remember about taking every thought captive is that it is a constant battle. We wage a constant battle for our minds. There are many different ways I thought of to go to illustrate this point, but I got to thinking about every January when we do a church-wide fast. Fasting is a wonderful thing to do in that I think not only does it show God that we're serious, but it sometimes teaches us things about God too. I remember the first time I ever did an extended fast. God taught me something. He said, you know, if you can give up something you have to have to live, you can give up things you don't need. I was like, yeah, you're right. So it left no place in my excuse book for saying, oh God, I just can't do without that. He said, no, if you can give up food which you have to have to live, you can give up that stuff that you don't really need. But I'm going to tell you something. If you ever join us on that fast, that 21-day fast, I like to do like a liquids-only fast because I feel like if, if I'm eating, you know, just giving up one meal a day, I, I, you know, I can eat a big meal for breakfast and a, and a big meal at night and that lunch meal. I don't feel, I'm not, I don't feel like it's as difficult to fast. That's, it can be very hard because you kind of get used to that. But I like the liquid fast. But I'm going to tell you, if you ever do the liquid fast, don't watch TV. Because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You're going to have a pizza commercial come on. And it's going to be 11 o'clock at night, which you need to be in bed anyway. But you're going to watch that and you think, oh, it's been all day. That tummy will start to grumble. Oh, and they're going to have good cheese on that thing. Oh, extra cheese. Mm. It's probably going to be stuffed in the crust. That's not even fair anymore. They're adding bacon to it. I saw something the other day that really made me laugh. It was on Facebook, I think. It said, I can't please everyone. I'm not bacon. <laughs> but if you're trying to fast, I tell you what, there's going to be a pizza commercial that's going to come on, and it's going to look good. Every topping that you like is going to be on it. And you're going to be like, oh, God, did you see what Pizza Hut had? <laughs> and I can get two of them for the price of one. But God, I'm giving it up for you. Oh, but Domino's, 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 wherefore art thou Domino's? breadsticks and sauce. Oh, God, you got to help me. Papa John's, Papa John's, Papa John's. Oh, my goodness, you have that little thing of yellow buttery garlic sauce. Mm. Oh, God, deliver me from them because they deliver. <laughs> and it is a struggle. It's a battle. And the same thing is true about our walk with God. Every day we're going to fight a battle for our mind. And the devil has all the good tricks to try to use to derail us from where God wants us to be. If it's in a fast, boy, he can... Let me tell you a story. When I used to pastor in Dickinson, North Dakota, I had to be bivocational. And so I had a job working the overnight graveyard shift in a gas station. Now, the wonderful thing about this gas station, it, it was right in the middle. It was right off of an exit. And there were several places to eat right around it. Cool thing is, we had a button in there that could call McDonald's next door. You could actually order food at your pump, pump your gas, and they would bring it over to you, and you could pay for it right there. You didn't even have to leave your car. It was great. I used to order uh, the apple pies. We had an apple pie machine inside if people wanted to get those. And so right before they would close, I'd order a fresh thing of apple pies because after they'd been in there so long, we had to throw them out. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, I threw one out after another. It was awesome. <laughs> but it was during this time, was the first time that I had tried to engage in an extended fast beyond like just a day or two. And so I was in the middle of this extended fast. And I'm telling you what, it was hard. Because there's a lot of junk in a convenience store that would be good to eat. Especially when you've not eaten for many days. Even the dead deli in the back looks good. Those burritos that have been in there since... Well, we won't talk about how long. And I had a button that I could call McDonald's, but let me tell you what made it even worse. After they closed, it was okay because I knew I couldn't get anything else from them. I'd cry as I threw away each of those apple pies at night. Just a little tear, thinking, oh, that looks so good. 
But in the back office of the gas station I worked at in a cabinet, we had menus from all the places to eat surrounding us. And there were times at 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the morning when no one was in the store and no one was pumping gas that I would look through those menus. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, mmm, all that liver and onions would be good right now. Never have I thought that. But in the middle of the night, in the middle of a fast, the devil will use every dirty trick in the book. And even looking through a menu, I wanted to eat the pictures of food. Because there was a battle going on. And we face a battle every day of our lives for our minds. Paul shows us a way of escape. Romans chapter 12, verses two, verse 2, it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Notice that he doesn't say by the changing of your actions. He says, do not be conformed to this world by the changing of your actions, but by the renewing of your mind. That's where the battle originates. That's where it begins. That's where the attack comes. If he can get it here, he can get it here. So we have to guard our minds. Let me wrap it up for you this morning this way. The three things that I want you to think about in terms of keeping every thought captive is that we don't want to be surprised when things in captivity act wild. Be prepared for that. Secondly, don't think just because it's raised in captivity that it changes the very nature of that beast. That its nature is its nature, and if you give it opportunity, it will attack you. And understand that the battle that we wage is a constant battle. There's no, you don't get vacation from the battle of your, against your, your flesh. The battle over your mind takes place over and over and over again. So how do we take every thought captive? How do we handle the constant onslaught of the enemy for our mind? I would love to hand you a plan that says, if you do this, 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 exactly this way, that it'll always work. But the enemy varies his attack, and so we have to vary our attack. So what I'm going to give you this morning is the place to start. How do I win victory over the attack of the enemy against my mind? You start. You start fighting that battle. You don't just say, okay, well, I just, he keeps getting, getting me in this area, God. You just, you, just under, you just have to understand, God, I just keep falling in this area. That's not God's plan for you. To be overwhelmed by whatever it is that the devil attacks you with. It is not his plan. He did not equip you that way when he uh, regenerated you. He gave you what you need to overcome those things. So here's what I want you to do. I think we've already covered the verse. Can you put Romans chapter 6 verse 4 back up on there? It says, we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb, that song we sang, and the word of our testimony. That's straight out of Scripture. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. The blood of the Lamb, when it is applied to our lives, changes the way that we fight. It changes how we fight against the attack of the enemy. It says, therefore we were baptized with Him, or buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of, of life. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. Your past, whatever it was, is not held against you. The blood of Christ covered that. And He equipped you to walk in the newness of life. He says it a different way in Galatians 2.20. He says, For I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the, in the faith of the Son, by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. When we die, when we're crucified with Christ, we are raised up to newness of life. We walk differently than we walked before. 
We think differently than we think thought bef- than we think before. I'll work on that. Than we thought before. We're no longer bound by the addictions and the struggles that we were before because God has given us the power to overcome those things. But for every testimony that Vicky has, altars are filled with those that continue going back to the same things that drag them down. Sometimes it frustrates me as a pastor to see someone come to the altar over and over and over again for the same thing. And I'm not frustrated with them. I'm frustrated with the devil for continuing to win that battle that he has no business being victorious in. He has no business winning that battle. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. I'll tell you how you win that battle. You need to understand your identity in Jesus Christ. You need to understand who it is that God made you. You need to understand how powerful you are, not in and of yourself, because the, but because of the power of God through the Holy Spirit is working in your life. You are not weak, you are not feeble, but you are powerful. You are mighty in God. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. doesn't matter what it is. Everything he throws at you, you're like, what else you got, devil? It's not me, it's him, and you're in trouble, bud. You have no business here. I'm not a huge fan of, of uh, Joel Olstein as a preacher. Whatever you think about them, whether you like him or not, if you do like him, I'm all right. If you don't like him, all right. But one thing that he does is before he preaches, they have kind of a congregational confession that they say. I wrote down. It says, This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I am about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you know that God gave this to us? So that we could know who He is. And we could know who we are through Him. It's not about self-promotion. It's not, well, you know, I'm a Christian, so I've got, you know. There's no spiritual merit badge program. Who we are is because of who He is. And what this book says about who we are and the authority that we have through Him, even Jesus Himself, when He was tempted in the wilderness, didn't say, well, devil, you don't know who I am. He quoted scripture to him. He quoted the scripture. And he was victorious in that place. He could so easily have not gone that way. We stand against the lies of the devil by the word of God. Now the text that I chose this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5, was written to believers. It wasn't written to the unbelievers. And so honestly, the message this morning is to you that are believers. For those of you that may not be be believers, this is available to you. I talked about this morning how this message was simple, but it's hard. If you don't know God, if you're not in a right relationship with Him, then your task is simple and hard. You have to choose what you're going to do with Jesus. When I was talking about simple and hard, I told you in baseball, you can fail 68% of the time and end up in the Hall of Fame. But if you fail with the question of what am I going to do with Jesus, it's past fail. It's not fail two-thirds of the time and still make it in. If you don't know Jesus this morning... The only hope that you have is right relationship with Him. And here in a minute, when we have an altar call, you have opportunity to come get right with God. If you don't know Him, you don't know what you're missing. Because He can give you the ability to have victory over every thought 
that you can take them captive and not be in bondage to those things. Whatever it is that you're dealing with, if you don't know Christ, if you come to know Him, He will give you the power to overcome those things. The greatest thing that I ever did was commit my heart to the Lord at 12 years of age. And I've spent the last 31 years learning about who He is to a greater and greater level in my life. But for those of you that are believers, this idea of taking every thought captive, it can be tiresome. Because the onslaught of the enemy is not fair. He will wait till you're weak. He will wait till you're at your most vulnerable. And he will come at you with everything that he has. I was reading through, as we close this morning, as I was reading through a journal that I had written. In 2003, there's an entry that I had written. Actually, it was on what would eventually become my daughter's birthday. It was February 19th of 2003. And I was meditating on the very first psalm. You know, psalm 1, 1 through 3, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose... Uh, who brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. And I was meditating on that that morning, and God stopped me on that third verse at the very end of it. It says, and whatever he does shall prosper. And a scary thought hit me. What if I'm struggling because of what I'm doing is prospering? What if as a child of God, you're being defeated because you're not taking thoughts captive and your lack of authority over those thoughts is prospering in such a way that you're defeated? If you're doing the things, let's put it another way, and whatever you don't do is not prospering. If you don't take those thoughts captive, you're not victorious. Because this is talking about the one who walks not in the, in the presence of the ungodly. We don't take their counsel. We're believers. So as believers, if we are not fighting that fight to take every thought captive, don't be surprised when the opposite prospers in your life. Don't be surprised when you find yourself constantly failing because you're not taking thoughts captive. If we take those thoughts captive, whatever we do shall prosper. Those thoughts that are held captive will not grow and bear fruit in our lives. Does that make sense? It was haunting to me to think that when I struggle, it's my fault. It's probably my fault. Because I, I love it when I have someone else to blame. It's not my fault, God. Someone else's fault. But the truth of it is we're each responsible before God for our own lives, for our own thought life, for the things that we'll entertain, for the things that we'll uh, allow to enter into our minds. Now the truth of it is, is you're not going to be able to avoid every bit of it. At some point you're going to watch a pizza commercial. At some point, that thought to allow anger, bitterness, lust, strife, you name it. Whatever it is that your struggle is, the devil's know, devil knows so well how to push your buttons. At some point, you're going to encounter those things. But are you going to take those thoughts captive? Or are you going to allow something else to prosper? I want victory to prosper in my life. I want victory over the attack of the enemy to be the thing that I experience. But I understand in order to do that, I must take every thought captive.